Welcome to Psychological Insights. I am your host, Cameron, and we welcome Dr. Robert Hamm. And doctor, can you please tell us a little bit about what you do? Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Cameron. Uh, I'm a psychologist and a psychotherapist here in the town of West Hartford. Uh, my office is in, uh, located in West Hartford Center. Um, I work with uh, adults mainly and adolescents, uh, families and couples. Uh, and I've been in practice for over 30 years. Uh, and I also uh, am a uh, professor at uh, Central Connecticut State University. So today's episode is about the ugly duckling syndrome. Can you talk about what that is? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, uh, this is an idea that uh, I had come up with uh, to, um, that refers to a uh, phenomenon where people, many people, uh, feel that there's something about them that's different, um, maybe something that's different that makes them stand out in a bad way. Uh, so that there's uh, concerns about whether they don't fit in or they're not good enough uh, and uh, it uh, can affect a person's self-esteem um, uh, and uh, can cause them a feeling of loneliness or isolation um, or even uh, to be uh, um, ostracized uh, by their peers or people in their families or communi communities. Uh, it's sort of like uh, the, uh, uh, the idea of being a black sheep, which we all know about. The Ugly Duckling was a fairy tale written by Hans Christian Andersen from the 19th century. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, it's a children's story. Um, it was um, created by this author, a poet, and uh, a famous author of children's stories. It always uh, stuck with me, I remember from my childhood, uh, because it had a very special message. It's about uh, a brood of ducklings, and there was one that kind of stood out, was kind of gawky and awkward looking, and uh, therefore it um, was treated differently uh, and uh, abused and ostracized because it was different. As it turns out, that it wasn't a duck. After all, it was a swan, and that's why it looked different and sort of ungainly and, and ugly. So that when it uh, matured into an adult, it became um, much bigger and uh, very beautiful and graceful. Um, so the uh, story has a message um, that, um, you know, if we feel that somehow we're different or not good enough, it, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we aren't good enough and it doesn't mean that who we are in the moment is something that is lasting, uh, that we have the capacity to uh, be transformed or to transform ourselves uh, and to grow into something that's beautiful and greater. Um, and also, it, it gives an important message that we are not necessarily the person uh, that uh, we are, as we are judged by other people. What does being different mean to you? Uh, well, it can mean uh, d many different things, of course. Uh, it's a double-edged sword. It can be good, it can be bad. Um, I think um, many of us want to feel in some ways that we are different, you know, that we're special, that we stand out in some ways. Um, and uh, there, I think it ties into our need to excel. Um, but the downside of being different is that we might be marginalized or ostracized by our peers or treated differently in some way is not good enough or we don't fit in. Uh, and uh, it speaks to something that exists within uh, each of us, Cameron, that we want to feel that we belong. We don't want to feel left out or somehow treated in a way that we're less than or not good enough. Uh, so these are universal uh, aspects of what it means uh, to be a part of a community, a part of a family. So um, differentness uh, could take on many different dimensions, whether you're taller or shorter, more talented, or less talented, or more intelligent, or um, um, 
It could uh, pertain to uh, what ethnic group or race that you are assigned to in life or what class, um, what community you come from, so many different things. So what are the basic principles you adhere as a psychotherapist? I'm sorry, what was that now? What are the basic principles you adhere as a psychotherapist? Um, well, with respect to uh, this concern that many people have that they might be different and maybe not good enough in some way, um, it's very important as a therapist uh, that you uh, demonstrate to your patient that uh, whatever d differentnesses they may feel about themselves, um, that it doesn't mean that those differences are bad necessarily. Um, secondly, uh, many people feel that they're different in some ways or bad, worse than other people when that's not true. Uh, it's a distortion. But because of how they're treated by others or maybe how they were raised by their parents or treated by their parents or siblings, uh, they feel that somehow there's something wrong with them. So as a therapist, it's very important, first of all, to, um, to establish a relationship with your patient that demonstrates that you accept them as they are, however different they may be or however different they may feel they may be. Um, and we do that by, um, we meaning the ther psychotherapist community, uh, do that by listening. Uh, and listening in a non-judgmental way, being open to what um, our patients' experiences are so that uh, they can don't feel judged, they feel accepted, that they can be themselves in therapy. And that allows them to be open with their therapist and, and to be open to exploring themselves, uh, to examine the rationality of their thought processes that brought them in to see me in the first place. So what can someone who feels different do to overcome and see that it's not bad to be different? Um, well, uh, stories like The Ugly Duckling um, is, are, are good to read and think about. Um, those stories are there for a reason and they've resonated uh, with, um, with society for a, a good reason. Um, <clears throat> I think today there's a lot of um, emphasis in society about the virtues of diversity. Um, so uh, if uh, <clears throat> you, are, you have friends or you're interested in making friendships, um, establish relationships with people who embrace differentness. Um, if there are certain aspects uh, about yourself that you feel that you are not accepted in the community, get involved in some kind of social or, or political group or cause. Um, and um, there are self-help books um, on uh, helping people to examine their thought processes, how to um, build self-esteem, accept themselves. And of course, um, there are people in the community such as myself, psychotherapists, that one can seek out and, um, and work with to help, uh, to help them feel uh, uh, better about themselves and to examine how being different isn't necessarily something that uh, has to be bad or um, um, something that is wrong. So um, how is it harder for someone who feels different to make friends? I think so um, in, in general. I mean being different is a, a, a double-edged sword as I say. Um, so uh, there, um, in my blog article that's, uh, that's attached to uh, this uh, topic on uh, the Ugly Dunkling Syndrome, I cite a famous uh, psychologist uh, from the early 20th century. His name was Otto Rank, um, who isn't well known today as he was many years ago, but he had a very important impact on the development of psychotherapy. Um, and um, 
What uh, I found appealing about Otto Rank's ideas is that he was the first psychologist to establish a classification system of people uh, that judged uh, people's potentials um, and uh, mental health, not on the basis of how much, um, how much there is about ourselves that's different or wrong um, and trying to eliminate those things that are bad or wrong, so to speak, a more medical model. Uh, he uh, offered a different kind of model that said that people who are different feel bad about themselves because they're different, but actually that differentness is a sign that they have the potential to be even greater uh, because there's something about them that stands out. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, his therapy has, um, you know, has been an inspiration to me uh, to help people in uh, looking, re-examining how they feel about themselves and being different. Uh, it can be an asset, a potential uh, to, um, to learn how to embrace themselves as different and therefore um, um, e evolve um, in, uh, with a greater degree of potential. Um, so you talked about the black sheep earlier. Can you explain more of what that means? Um, well, it's a, it's a common phrase that uh, most of us, you know, are familiar with. Um, so being a black sheep often means that somehow that uh, you're not accepted by your family. Um, and the reason being that somehow you're different uh, since um, a black sheep is something that is uh, different than the norm. Um, and when you're identified as such, either because you see that yourself that way, even, others, even if others don't, or you're treated that way, uh, it creates challenges, doesn't it, in, in terms of being able to accept ourselves. We don't feel that we're good enough or that we belong um, and so people who have been identified as black sheep have a greater degree of difficulty in finding their way, I think, through life and th uh, because they have difficulty in accepting themselves. But uh, the good news is that when you do learn to embrace yourself, that um, you embrace your differentness and it allows you to, um, to go you take your own path. Uh, and sometimes it allows you to rise above uh, the uh, average person. So what kinds of things can people do to embrace themselves to overcome the challenges? Um, well, uh, you know, as I was saying before, uh, it uh, helps to uh, establish friendships with people who are accepting of your differentness. Um, seeing a therapist such as myself to help you with um, you know, uh, feelings of, uh, you know, low self-esteem, not accepting yourself as you'd like to. Um, and uh, in, in families, sometimes it means um, establishing a relationship with families, if possible, that opens up a dialogue about how you may feel that if you're being treated differently than others and, um, and uh, try to establish a, a good relationship with family members. It's not always possible, but when that is, um, um, many people who uh, feel uh, that they are black sheep, it's, uh, sometimes it's just a feeling, it's not a reality. Um, and so it's helpful to um, check that out with other people and see if they see you in the way that you see yourself. And your paper you talked about, like people bully people just because they're different. Mm -hmm. What types of bullying would that be? Um, well, uh, it can anybody anywhere it can be a subject to bullying. Um, so today we know how um, young people often are bullied on the internet. Uh, somebody is different in some way, and so uh, their peers. Um, may gang up on them and identify th uh, that person as being different and uh, tease them in some way, uh, harass them. Um, and so sometimes we see in the, in the media, in the news, uh, you know, some tragic event where s um, some child or uh, some, um, a young person uh, uh, commits suicide because of that. Um, 
Uh, but it doesn't have to be necessarily on the internet. I mean, I think that bullying has probably take, taken place since time began in, in families and in communities and society. Um, so if you belong to a community and somehow you're different, uh, you're not, um, you're going to be subject to bullying. Uh, it's, it's interesting. So I'm just thinking from my childhood, um, I lived in a uh, sort of a cul-de-sac uh, suburban neighborhood with my family and there was um, a family that lived in our neighborhood who that was different. Um, and um, so the children, uh, um, well, in the household, they didn't have any furniture. The only thing they had was a, a grand piano that, that I remember. So, I mean, there was just, you know, the, the sort of very stark and uh, vacant rooms. And in the summertime, the children went barefoot. They didn't wear any shoes or socks or anything. So because of that, those differences about this family, uh, I remember myself, not so much myself, I would hope, <laughs> I'd spent a long time, but my peers, the kids in the neighborhood, would bully and tease them. Uh, they were ostracized uh, because of their differentness in these ways. But the reasons that the, the children without, went without shoes and they, there was no furniture and there's just a grand piano is that the parents were saving money uh, um, uh, you know, so stringently that they were, they were training and preparing them, their children for careers, successful careers, to be musicians and scientists. So many years later, I remember our family would receive a newsletter every Christmas from that family about all the achievements and accolades the children had received uh, because of, of all of the efforts that the parents made to sacrifice for the sake of their children's futures. That's really cool. Yeah. In your paper, you talked about how you have people mm -hmm. who come to you with feelings of dejection. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, it's interesting because uh, some of my patients often, well, in, when we're meeting in the course of our sessions, will comment on how they feel that they're the only one. They're the only one that has that kind of problem. Um, and that, so they might be coming in because they feel depressed or they feel anxious. Um, but that feeling of isolation and feeling of differentness only compounds and makes worse their feelings of depression or anxiety. Um, so I try to reassure them uh, that uh, the problems that they suffer from are not uncommon. Uh, maybe they might be to a greater degree than the average person. Um, and it certainly is uh, no reason to feel worse than other people or to feel that somehow that you're not worthy in some way. So I'll work with a patient to help them re-examine uh, re how they see themselves. Um, and in psychology we have this term called reframing. Um, it's a term that's used in cognitive therapy. It's a form of uh, therapy that I use. And reframing, reframing means that we help a person to see what they see, let's say they feel that they're different, and I say, well, being different necessarily is not a bad thing. Um, reframing that idea of differentness uh, may mean that they have the potential uh, to be someone who is outstanding in some way. Um, um, so I help them to examine um, how uh, Feeling different ne doesn't necessarily mean that you're inferior or inadequate and uh, it helps them to reassess who they are and judge themselves in a more forgiving and accepting way. So what are some of the challenges they have to overcome? I think the greatest challenge that each and every one of us has is in realizing that we, what we assume to be reality. Um, is uh, not necessarily so set in stone or determined as we think it is, but rather that um, how we see ourselves is more a function of our perceptions, our attitudes, our thought processes. Uh, so if we re-examine what we believe as um, an outgrowth, uh, outgrowth of what we believe, that it's our thinking, 
and our attitudes and our perspectives, it, empower us, it empowers us to realize that we have the potential to change how we think about something. It opens up our minds to looking at things from a different perspective, one that's more accepting, uh, one that's more creative. So it's uh, help a patient to realize that they have the power and the potential to uh, see things differently and um, therefore um, they can create um, a different reality uh, than the one that they're used to. Is there anything else you wanted to touch upon today? I'm just thinking about my article uh, in my blog. I'm, my um, blog is attached to uh, my website. That, and my website's name is Robert Ham with two N's, PhD.com. Um, and there you can read all about my practice and, um, and my blog is on the menu bar and so is this, this uh, TV show, uh, Psychological Insights. Um, and in, in the, this blog article on the Ugly Duckling Syndrome, um, I also uh, include a, a comparison to uh, um, um, biology. Uh, so we all know who Charles, Charles Darwin was. He was a uh, famous uh, biologist back in the 19th century that we attribute modern evolutionary theory to. Um, well, you know, Darwin is famous for his theory of natural selection. Um, so most of us are aware of what that is. Um, and natural selection, you know, is based on this notion that it's uh, adaptation how we adapt that determines whether we survive, whether species survive, other generations are passed on. Darwin's theory of natural selection is based on the virtue of variety. That every species needs a, a variety of different types, you know, um, that um, some, you know, with regard to people or uh, animals, different sizes, shapes, colors, um, talents and whatnot. And that uh, variety allows um, a species to have enough different types uh, that would uh, allow it uh, to adapt to different situations. So in some situations, the short, one might, short ones might do better, in others, the tall ones. So I think it's a bit of a lesson uh, for us to take from Darwin's theory of natu uh, natural selection that differentness is a good thing. <laughs> We all want to belong, we all want to be a part of, that's natural. But it's also natural to be different. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think we should take a page from Darwin's theory of natural selection that differentness is, is good. Well, thank you for your time. This is uh, Psychological Insights. I'm your host, Cameron, and we will see you next month. Thank you. <laughs>